Hey everyone, this lesson is on the disease known as sporotrichosis. So what is sporotrichosis? Sporotrichosis is actually an infection caused by the fungal species known as sporothrix schenkii, and sorry for the pronunciation, and it looks like this. It is actually a dimorphic fungi. So sporotrichosis is a fungal infection with the sporothrix fungus. Now sporotrichosis is also known as Rose Gardner's disease because as we will see, Touching and being in contact with roses and rose bushes is a risk factor for actually getting this fungal infection. So what is the epidemiology of sporotrichosis? This fungus actually lives in the soil, on plants, and on other organic matter. So we talked about one of the plants being roses, and some organic matter, you could see this on things like hay, and we can see it on moss as well. And it occurs worldwide. So the risk factors, we talked about one of them, gardening, specifically gardening with rose bushes is one risk factor for actually getting sporotrichosis. Another one is landscaping, again, due to the contact with soil and plants and other organic matter. And then being immunocompromised is also a risk factor as well, because being immunocompromised increases your risk for infections in general, and sporotrichosis is one of them. So again, risk factors, gardening especially with rose bushes, landscaping, and being immunocompromised. So we'll now quickly talk about the roots of infection of this fungus that leads to sporotrichosis. So the fungus can be contracted through the following roots. Direct cutaneous inoculation, so direct inoculation into your skin, so if you have a cut and the spores of the fungus get into that cut, that is a direct cutaneous inoculation. There's also the possibility of you can inhale the conidia and you can get the infection into your lungs. And then there's also hematogenous spread. Hematogenous spread means it's spread from one location and goes to another location and it's spread through your blood. So hematogenous spread, this leads to disseminated disease and it's more likely to occur in patients with certain comorbidities like alcoholism, COPD, and diabetes. So again, direct cutaneous inoculation. So if there's cut on your hand or on your arm and also through inhalation of conidia and then also this hematogenous spread. Now we'll talk about some of the clinical features and subtypes of sporotrichosis. So we're gonna break it down into five different subtypes of this condition. So the first one is known as lymphocutaneous. So as its name suggests, it involves the cutaneous tissue. So we talked about that direct cutaneous inoculation that's going to be the cause here. And we can also get in the lymphatics as well. So the lymphatic system can be infected. So lymphocutaneous is one subtype. It's actually the most common type of sporotrichosis. And what happens is if there is direct cutaneous inoculation, a papule develops in that location within days to weeks of inoculation. So it can take a little while before you actually start to see something develop. And this is what it could look like, a papule develops. And that papule could stay as a papule or could ulcerate, become an ulcer, or it could become a nodule, so it could be raised. And we can also see something known as lymphatic lesions. And lymphatic lesions are where we see the infection getting into the lymphatic system. We can see lesions like this. So it travels along the lymphatic channels, causing lymphatic lesions. And Oftentimes, this leads to a mild pain and there's no systemic symptoms. So again, papule can form and then you can get this seeding into the lymphatic channels and we can see lesions along these lymphatic channels causing lesions like this. Now, another type is pulmonary sporotrichosis. This, again, we talked about inhalation of conidia. This is more likely to occur in patients with COPD and alcoholism, so chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And the features here are actually reminiscent of tuberculosis. So these include constitutional symptoms like fever, night sweats, weight loss, fatigue. We can see productive cough. So productive cough means that there's sputum being produced, dyspnea, so shortness of breath, and hemoptysis, so coughing up blood. So it does appear to look like either tuberculosis or a type of lung cancer. So we can see symptoms like this. And then oftentimes, if pulmonary sporotrichosis is left untreated, it can lead to death because of a lot of these symptoms. So as you can see, there's quite a bit of difference between these two subtypes. And a lot of times, the lymphocutaneous subtype 
because it's the most common type, it's more easily diagnosed. Some of these other subtypes we're going to talk about, including the pulmonary subtype, are more difficult to diagnose. So those are the first two subtypes. Now we're going to talk about another subtype known as osteoarticular. So osteo involving bones and articular involving the joints or the articulations. And this usually occurs through hematogenous spread, but it could be through direct inoculation. So if there's some puncture into a joint and the spores get into that location, the sporothrix fungi get in there, we could see this type of presentation, osteoarticular presentation. This occurs, again, more commonly in patients with alcoholism, and it can affect one or more joints. So the infection can lead to infection of one or more joints. And the joints most commonly affected are the knees, elbows, wrists, and ankles. And then what happens here is that there's a progressive worsening joint pain, decreased range of motion, and increased swelling over time if this is not treated. Another subtype of sporotrichosis is meningeal sporotrichosis. So the meninges are the layers that layer the brain, and these include the duramater, arachnoid mater, and pyomater. This subtype is very rare. It's more likely to occur in patients with compromised immune systems like AIDS patients and lymphoma patients. And oftentimes these symptoms can be chronic. It can last for weeks to months. And because it's meningeal or meningitis, we're going to see fever, headache, neck stiffness. And the last subtype is disseminated. So disseminated sporotrichosis, as its name suggests, it gets disseminated throughout the entire body. We see this with patients with AIDS, again, immunocompromised patients, may occur with meningeal symptoms. So we can see meningeal symptoms in this disseminated type because it's just disseminated throughout the entire body. Now, disseminated sporotrichosis is very, very rare, but when it does occur, it can lead to Symptoms in a variety of different bodily systems, including the eyes, the larynx, pericardium, the liver, the spleen, many other parts of the body. So it gets disseminated throughout the entire body. So how is sporotrichosis diagnosed and treated? So the diagnosis of sporotrichosis oftentimes is a clinical diagnosis. So especially with the lymphocutaneous presentation of sporotrichosis, it becomes easier to recognize and to diagnose, especially when taking into context those risk factors we talked about if a patient gardens a lot or does landscaping this can help clue in on the diagnosis of sporotrichosis so oftentimes it's clinical diagnosis but a culture culturing the fungus itself is often the gold standard for diagnosis so this can come from tissue biopsies or joint aspiration so if it's an osteoarticular sporotrichosis aspirating from the joint and culturing the fungus can lead to the diagnosis, those types of ways of culturing. And with regards to pulmonary sporotrichosis, on a chest x-ray, when a chest x-ray is performed, it looks like tuberculosis or TB. So we talked about it being very reminiscent of tuberculosis, and it can actually appear like tuberculosis on a chest x-ray. So when looking at the chest x-ray, it can be unilateral, bilateral, upper lobe involvement. So it looks a lot like tuberculosis. Now the treatment of sporotrichosis is using antifungals. So this is again a fungal infection. So itraconazole is the oftentimes the first treatment that clinicians will use for this condition. If it's a refractory case, which means that the itraconazole doesn't work, amphotericin B, so IV or intravenous amphotericin B will be used. Amphotericin B is like the big gun in the antifungal world. And then disseminated cases, if it's throughout the entire body, again, intravenous amphotericin B is used as well. So again, diagnosis is clinical diagnosis oftentimes, but culture can be helpful and is often the gold standard for diagnosis. Treatment involves itraconazole, and if that doesn't work, amphotericin B. And if it's a disseminated sporotrichosis, amphotericin B is used in that case. So if you want to learn more about other infectious diseases, please check out my infectious disease playlist. And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel stay up to date on future lessons. Thanks so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.